Hey class and welcome to chapter six. Uh, this will be the first start of module two and module two is all on the skeletal system. So the first chapter, chapter six is on an introduction to skeletal and bone tissues. And then chapter seven and eight go through the bones of your skeletal system and chapter nine goes through joints. In this module, use your uh, lecture PowerPoints that I posted as well as the videos to help you study for a lab and learn all the bones because they will be a great resource for you for looking at all the different types of bones. So before we start talking about bones, we need to talk about cartilage and I'll explain why. Um, the location and structure of cartilages, cartilages are found throughout the adult body. You have cartilage in your external ear, in your nose, you have articular cartilages and costal cartilage that cover the end of your bones so that your bones are never rubbing bone on bone. There's a nice smooth surface. Uh, you have cartilages in your larynx, your trachea, in your intervertebral discs, pubic symphysis, which connects your pubic bones together, and the articular discs. And we covered a little bit of this when we talked about cartilage in connective tissue. So here's a look at cartilages in the body and the different types of cartilage and where they're found throughout the body. So elastic cartilage in green is found in your external ear, uh, your epiglottis, you have hyaline cartilage, more in blue uh, in your costal cart cartilage and the articular cartilage of your joints. And then fibrocartilage you see as intervertebral discs and the menisci or the pad-like discs uh, between um, the bones in your knee cavity. The pericardium, so whenever we see the prefix or suffix condo, that has to do with cartilage. So perichondrium surrounds cartilages. It resists outward pressure and functions in growth and repair of the cartilage. It consists primarily of water and is a very resilient tissue and it, where it springs back to original shape. All cartilages share some similarities. Um, the primary cell type is the chondrocyte. So we can see that chondro suffix again. They are located in the lacuna, and the matrix includes fibers and a jelly-like ground substance. Hyaline cartilage is the most abundant cartilage type. Um, the hyaline cartilage provides support through flexibility and resistance, and the ground substance holds a large amount of water. Elastic cartilage contains many elastic fibers. It's able to tolerate repeated bending, so we find it in the epiglottis and the cartilage of the external ear. And then the fibrocartilage resists strong compression and strong tension. It's kind of an intermediate type between hyaline and elastic cartilage, and we can find it um, in these locations, the pubic symphysis, meniscus of the knee, and as well as the annulus fibrosis in the intervertebral discs. So here's the different types of cartilage. You've seen this from um, the chapter on connective tissue. Hyaline cartilage looks nice and glossy, not a lot of fibers. Elastic cartilage has those elastic fibers and fibrocartilage has kind of those collagen fiber bundles in it as well. The growth of cartilage can happen apositionally or interstitially. Apositionally is when the chondroblasts and the surrounding pericardium, which covers it, produce new growth. And interstitial growth happens within, where the chondrocytes uh, within the cartilage divide and secrete new matrix. Cartilage will stop growing when your skeleton stops growing. Then we'll get to tissues and bone. The bones contain several types of tissues. It's dominated by bone connective tissue, but there is some nervous and blood connective tissue in bone. It contains cartilage in the articular cartilages that cover the surfaces or the ends of the bone and it also contains epithelial tissue lining the blood vessels. Here are the functions of your bones. They help to support, provide a hard framework for the body. Movement, so skeletal muscles use bones as levers when they're attached to move your arms and legs. Bones protect underlying organs like your skull bones, protect your, your um, cerebrum, um, the bones of your rib cage, protect your lungs and your heart. Your bones help to store minerals, so they act as a reservoir for important minerals. In your bones is where all of your blood cells are formed. Um, the bone contains red marrow, and that's where your red blood cells are formed. And then energy metabolism, your osteoblasts secrete osteocalcin, um, which helps to metabolize energy. So the bone tissue is made up of organic and inorganic components. We are The organic components are the cells, fibers, and ground substance. And the inorganic components are all the mineral salts that invade the bony matrix. 
The extracellular matrix of bone is very unique. It's made of about 35% um, organic components, which give it its tensile strength and flexibility, and about 65% inorganic components, which provide an exceptional hardness to bone to resist compression in all directions. Here are the main types and cells of bones that you should know, the osteoprogenitor cells, which are stem cells that will differentiate into an osteoblasts, Osteoblasts build bone. They actively produce and secrete more matrix. And then osteocytes keep bone um, matrix healthy. Osteoclasts are also found within bone tissue and they're responsible for the resorption of bone. So they kind of kill bone and break it apart. They're derived from a line of white blood cells and they secrete extremely acidic and powerful hydrochloric acid and lysosomal enzymes to break down bone and resorb it. The classifications of bones, we can have long bones, short bones, flat bones, or irregular bones. Long bones are longer than they are wide, like your femur, your humerus, the bones of your limbs. Short bones are roughly cube-shaped. Um, the bones in your wrist are short bones. The flat bones are thin and flattened. They're usually curved, so we'll find flat bones in your skull. And then irregular bones have various shapes like your vertebra and your vertebral column. So here are examples of long bones, flat bones, short bones, and irregular bones throughout the body. We find short bones in the bones of your ankles, your wrists, flat bones in your, in your sternum, your skull, and then irregular bones. Here's a look at a vertebrae. And then long bones, here's your humerus, but we could classify um, radius, tibia, ulna, fibula, uh, femur, all in the long bone category. Then the gross anatomy of bones, we covered this a little bit in connective tissue of bones and now we're gonna dive into it more detailed. Um, compact bones is the dense outer layer of bone and spongy, the cancellous bone is the internal network of bone. It has trabeculae, which look like little beams or sponge-like and the open spaces between the trabeculae are filled with marrow. The diaphysis is the shaft of the bone. So we're looking at the typical structure of a long bone. The diaphysis is the longer shaft of the part of the bone. The epitheses are the ends of the bone, whether it's the proximal end or the distal end. Blood vessels are within a long bone, so it's well vascularized. The medullary cavity is the hollow cavity filled with yellow marrow. And there's membranes or coverings of the bone, the periosteum, the perforating collagen fiber bundles known as Sharpie's fibers, and the end osteum. So here's a look at the structure of a long bone. You should know pictures like this well, both for lecture and lab. The epiphyses are the ends, proximal, distal. That's what will be um, covered with the articular cartilage, which provide a sliding surface as bones connect to other bones. Here's the diaphysis, and we zoom in on a part of the diaphysis with the medullary cavity filled with yellow bone marrow, which stores a lot of fats and lipids. The compact bone then kind of surrounds the surfaces of the bones. The periosteum covers the bone. We have arteries. Um, here's a look at what spongy bone looks like with the trabeculae um, and the spaces in between. So flat bones, short bones, and irregular bones contain bone marrow, but no marrow cavity. And we call this the diploe, the internal spongy bone of flat bones. And we can see here the flat bones has compact bones and within it has the spongy bone. And you can see the trabeculae, the spongy bone within those flat bones. The bone design and stress, um, the anatomy of the bone reflects stresses and the compression and tension are greatest at the external surfaces of the bone. So if we look here, we can see tension here, compression here. This is all happening at the external surfaces of the bone. So if we see a point of stress, the tension and compression on opposite sides will cancel each other out. And as a result, much less bone material is needed internally than superficially. And this is looking where the load, the body weight, uh, threatens to bend this bone along the arc. So that's why the bone is kind of um, designed how it is. Here's a look at the compression and tension lines of the bone within the trabeculae of the spongy bone and how the load will happen right where it's connected in the joint, for example, the shoulder. Compression, tension lines, you guys don't really need to know for lecture or lab. Bone markings, you do need to know. These are superficial surfaces of bones that reflect stressors on them. 
there are three broad categories of bone markings. They can be projections, pieces that stick out of bones where muscles will attach, surfaces that form joints with other bones, and depressions or openings that serve a purpose for either arteries or nerves to go through. So here's a look at different types of projections that are sites of muscle and ligament attachment. We can have tuberosities, um, crests, trochanters, and then different lines, which uh, normally, again, are, serve as an attachment point for muscles, tubercles, epicondyles, spine, and a process. So read through these bone markings. As you learn the different structures of these bones, you'll have to learn um, the different names of these bone markings on every name, and you'll be doing a lot of that in lab. Surfaces that form joints, we can have heads, facets, and condyles. They're all different types of surfaces that form joints with other bones. And then depressions and openings, foramen, grooves, fissures, notches, fossas, meatus, and sinus. Read through all these bone markings on these two pages to get an idea of what it's referring to. And then again, you're gonna have lots of time to practice these when you learn the different bone markings on all the bones. Here's the microscopic structure of a compact bone. Um, the osteon is the bone unit. And within the osteon, we have the central canal, which is where all the blood vessels and nerves go through. Uh, the lamella are, is the bone matrix that surrounds the central canal. And the lacuna are little spaces where the osteocyte sits. And then the canaliculi serve as um, connective pieces between the lacuna to allow for communication. Here's the osteon, different osteons in, or also known as reversion systems. And then the um, lamella, which surround the osteon. The circumferential lamella is the lamella, lamella that covers the exterior of the bone. And if you have interstitial lamella, that's just the lamella that's kind of between osteons. Here's perforating Volkmann's canals, which connect osteons together. Um, and here's central canals that run parallel with the diaphysis of the bone. And then the perforating canals just connect those central canals together. So compact bone contains passageways for blood vessels, lymph vessels, and nerves. It contains osteons, which are long cylindrical structures. They function in support, and they structurally resemble rings of a tree in a cross section. An osteon, this bone unit, contains lamella, central canal, perforating canals, and canaliculi. So here's a look at a single osteon containing the structures in the central canal, the lamella, which surround it. The collagen fibers will run in different directions within that osteon. Spongy bone is much less complex than compact bone. The trapeculae contain layers of lamella and osteocytes that are too small to contain osteons. So here's a look at spongy bone with the trabeculae. Then we get to part two, and I can had, had it all in one PowerPoint. We'll look, about, look at how bones develop, and this will be important for answering your case study question, which includes um, a real case study from your instructor, me. Ossification or osteogenesis is bone tissue formation. Membranous bones are formed directly from the mesenchyme and what we call intramembranous ossification. And other bones develop initially from hyaline cartilage, and that's what we call endochondral ossification. So here's a look at intramembranous ossification, where the ossification centers develop in the fibrous connective tissue. Mesenchymal cells um, from the embryo will cluster and differentiate into osteoblasts, forming an ossification center. The osteos osteoid, which is the bone matrix, will be secreted and calcify or harden. The osteoblasts continue to secrete osteoid, which calcifies in a few days, and the trapped osteoblasts become osteocytes. Then woven bone and periosteum will form, accumulating osteoid is laid, forming a network of trabeculae, and then the vascularized mesenchyme will condense on the external face of the bone and become the periosteum. Compact bone will eventually replace the woven bone just deep to the periosteum, and red marrow will develop, and from this red bone marrow will be more red blood cells that form. All bones, except some bones of the skull and clavicles, are modeled in what we call hyaline cartilage, and this is, will be endochondral ossification, where they start from a hyaline cartilage model. It begins forming late in the second month of embryonic development and then continues forming until early adulthood. 
Um, so until early adulthood, 18 years old, um, your bones are still changing and growing in length. So here's a look at endochondral ossification of a long bone. So we start with a hyaline cartilage model, and then, then the bone will grow in length as the periosteal bud invades the internal cavities, spongy bone forms, secondary ossification centers appear in the epiphyses. Eventually the epiphyses or the ends of the bones will ossify, harden into bone, and when completed, the hyaline cartilage remains only in the epiphyseal plates and the articular cartilage. So the epiphyseal plates are within the bone and that's where bone will continue to grow in length a little bit, as well as the articular cartilage. And the articular cartilage is important so that the bones can slide past each other when they're connected. In the epiphyseal plates of growing bones, the cartilage is organized for quick, efficient growth. Cartilage cells form tall stacks where chondroblasts at the top of the stacks divide quickly. This pushes the epiphysis away from the diaphysis as it gets longer, and this will lengthen the entire bone. Older chondrocytes will signal the surrounding matrix to calcify. Um, this leaves long trabeculae or spines of calcified cartilage. Trabeculae are partly eroded by osteoclasts, and then osteoblasts cover trabeculae with bone tissue. The trabeculae will be eaten away from their tips by osteoclasts. So here's a look at the organization of cartilage within the epiphyseal plate of a growing long bone. We can see um, the resting zone is here. Proliferation zone is, is where the cartilage cells will undergo my, mitosis and divide. Hypertrophic zone, the older cartilage cells will enlarge. Then they'll become calcified in the calcified zone. And then in the ossified zone, we finally get new bone forming. So this is occurring um, at the epiphyseal growth plate within the epiphyses of your long bones. During childhood and adolescence, adolescence, bones will lengthen entirely by growth of the epiphyseal plates. Cartilage is replaced with bone connective tissue as quickly as it grows. An epiphyseal plate maintains a constant thickness where the whole bone will lengthen. As adolescence draws to an end, the chondroblasts divide less often, the epiphyseal plates will become thinner and stop growing, and long bones will stop lengthening when the diaphysis and the epiphysis uh, fuse together. So the growing bones will widen as they lengthen. So osteoblasts will add bone tissue to the external surface, and osteoclasts will remove bone from the internal surface. So this is called apositional growth, um, when the growth of the bone by the addition of bone tissues to the surface, so they kind of get wider in diameter. That's apositional growth. Hormonal regulation of growth is uh, helps to maintain bone growth. So we have growth hormone produced by the pituitary gland that stimulates the epiphyseal plates in puberty to grow. Thyroid hormone ensures that the skeleton retains proper proportions. And then we have different sex hormones, estrogen in females, testosterone in males, that also helps to promote bone growth and these kind of kick into gear during puberty. Uh, they later induce closure of epiphyseal plates. Bone remodeling then. So bone is a dynamic living tissue. This is why when we break bones, they can remodel and heal. About 500 milligrams of calcium may enter or leave the adult skeleton each day. The bone matrix and osteocytes are continually removed and replaced. Cancellous bone of the skeleton is replaced every three to four years, and compact bone is replaced every 10 years. Bone deposit and removal, this occurs at your periosteal and the end osteal surfaces, so the outside and inner surface of the bones. Um, bone deposition is accomplished by osteoblasts because they build bone and bone reabsorption is accomplished by osteoclasts because they kill bone. And this happens when you get braces put on your teeth. Your osteoblasts and osteoclasts are working to reform um, your bones of your teeth uh, to make them nice and straight. So this is a look at remodeling of sponging bone, how the osteoclasts and osteoplasts build new bone or reabsorb other bone. An osteoclast is a bone degrading cell. It's a giant cell with lots of nuclei. It crawls along bone surfaces and it breaks down bone tissue by secreting concentrated hydrochloric acid, lysosomal enzymes. It's a cell that's derived from hematopoietic stem cells. So here's a look at an osteoclast. 
Um, it has a ruffled border and it kind of crawls along bones and eats them or kills them to reabsorb them. The repair of bone fractures. So use this to help answer your case study. Um, we can have a simple or a compound fracture and it's treated by reduction where it can be a closed reduction or an open reduction. And these are the stages of healing within a bone fracture. A hematoma or blood clot will form to try to clot or um, stop bleeding. Fibrocartilaginous callus will form first of all, and then the bony callus will replace it. And then the bone remodeling will occur with osteoblasts and osteoclasts remodeling the bone. Here's a look at common types of fractures, um, the fracture type, and then the what happens, this is a comminuted fracture, comminuted, where bone fragments into three or more pieces. This is particularly common in the age, the elderly, where whose bones are more brittle. A compression fracture is when the bone is crushed. And this is common in porous bones like osteoporotic bones, subjected to extreme trauma like a fall. We can have a spiral fraction, which is a, just a ragged break occurs when excessive twisting forces are applied to a bone. And this is very common in a sports fracture. So this is what my daughter had. Again, check out the case study for more information with that. An epiphyseal fracture, the epiphysis separates from the diaphysis along the epiphyseal plate. And this tends to occur where the cartilage cells are dying and calcification of the matrix is occurring. A depressed fracture is when broken bone um, is pressed inward, and this is typical of a skull fracture. A green stick fracture is the bone breaks in completely, and this is much in the way of a green twig breaks where only one side of the shaft breaks and the other side of the shaft uh, bends. Osteoporosis is one disorder of the bone. It's characterized by low bone mass where bone reabsorption outspaces bone deposition. And this occurs often in women after menopause as their hormones are changing um, because hormones play a great deal in, um, in your bones and maintaining bone density. So here's a look at normal bone and osteoporotic bone that has pores in it. It's kind of been eaten away. Um, so good things to uh, counteract osteoporosis are to take calcium sub sub supplements, but also to do weight bearing exercise to try to increase the strength of the bone. Osteomalacia occurs in adults where bones are inadequately mineralized and rickets occurs in children. It's analogous to osteomalacia, but in children. And here's a look at rickets in children. Um, and you might see kind of the bending out of the knees as well as you can see um, within uh, an x-ray, kind of the less mineralized of those bones. Osteosarcoma is a type of form of bone cancer. Um, and then the skeleton throughout life, the cartilage grows quickly in youth and the skeleton shows fewer chondrocytes in the elderly. Bones are, time, are a timetable. So the mesoderm gives rise to embryonic mesenchyme cells. The mesenchyme produces membranes and cartilage and membranes and cartilage will ossify to, uh, to form bones later. Here are primary ossification centers um, in the skeleton of a 12 week old fetus. So where the ossification centers occur and as they grow to form the skeleton. The skeleton grows until the age of about 18 to 21. So for some of you, your skeleton bones might still be growing. In children and adolescents, bone formation exceeds the rate of bone reabsorption. And in young adults, bone formation and bone reabsorption are in balance. And in old age, reabsorption predominates, so kind of breaking away of the bones. And bone mass will decline uh, as you get older. That's it for chapter six. Come back for chapter seven and eight when we go through the different types of bones. I hope you guys are all doing well.